Thank you very much. So again, uh, thank, welcome everyone uh, to this session. A warm welcome to all of the presenters and especially the attendees. My name is Igor Lesko. Uh, I come from Open Education Global, uh, the co-organizer co of Open Education Global Conference together with the University of Nantes. And I'm going to be a chair for this particular session. And we also have a rapporteur here, uh, Judith Sabesta, who is the executive director of the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas in the United States. Welcome, Judith. Uh, as a rapporteur, Judith will be monitoring presentations and also exchanges in the, in the chat and will then write a short report on the issues discussed here. Thank you, Judith. And I should also say that actually in her free time, Judith likes to organize talent shows and she did organize two during a global conference. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Uh, we have four presentations in this particular slot. Each presenter or a group of presenters will have 20 minutes uh, for the presentation. This will then be followed by five minutes of questions and answers after each presentation. And at the end, we will then have approximately 10 to 15 minutes for a sort of bigger discussion of any pending items that still need to be addressed. I would also like to encourage you all to please post your questions in the chat window uh, as you listen to the presenters, and we will then address them during the Q&A or during the larger discussion time. The four presentations in this particular slot are positioned within the three areas of the UNESCO OER recommendation. I think that at this point in time, you all should have read the recommendation at least three times, so I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail. But uh, just, broad, just uh, shortly, uh, we, we have one presentation that is positioned within the uh, capacity building for OER, and that's Paola Corti. There are two presentations uh, positioned within the, the sustainability models for OER. Uh, this is Margreta Tuesme and Max Mahmoud together with Sarah Hutton. And the final one is related to the supportive policies for open educational resources. And that one is going to be done jointly by Javier Atenas and Leo Havemann. However, however, as you will be listening to the presentations, uh, it will become apparent that actually each, uh, each presentation has a relevance for more than one UNESCO OER recommendation areas. Um, so again, just a reminder that uh, if you have any questions, please post them into the chat window during the presentation. Our first presentation uh, will be done by Paola Corti. Uh, Paola Corti is uh, from Spark Europe, uh, which is the scholarly publishing, publishing academic research coalition Europe uh, that she joined for, uh, relatively recently. That's part of uh, her part-time job and her other part-time job is for Politecnico di Milano in Italy. And Paola actually, for those of you who are not aware, Paola together with her team, they hosted the 2019 Open Education Global Conference. So welcome Paola. Uh, Paola is gonna be doing a presentation on the European Academic Libraries at Work. Let's build capacity together. Uh, Paola, you can go ahead. Hi everyone. Uh, can you see my screen already? Okay then. So um, as Igor said, I'm, I joined uh, Spark Europe uh, quite recently, starting in February this year. And I am working mainly with the, the European network of open education librarians. And uh, I am not a librarian actually. I work with them as open education community manager. And it's a pleasure for me to, to learn from them each day. I can just tell you that uh, every day is a discovery. Uh, today, I'm gonna share with you some of the main activities that we are doing together and that we started and some of the progresses that we are trying to, to do as a network supporting each other. What you will see is, a, let's say, a showcase of the um, outputs that we are willing to share very soon with anyone. But mainly what I would really like you to bear in mind while I'm talking is that uh, the fil rouge that links all those activities together is the attitude of librarians to support each other and to be there for each other. In uh, being that I joined the NOL starting this year, we were in the middle of the pandemic. I never man, met anyone so far in presence. We've been just working online and meeting the online for the first time, most, mostly, I would say. So this is, a, let's say, the, the story of a journey that we are doing together. Um, let me go to the next slide. Okay. So first of all, uh, the annual 
is, is, uh, has been recently uh, funded because uh, it was born during uh, the OE Global Conference in Delft in 2018, to be, <laughs> to be precise. And uh, we have 80 members and uh, 22 countries now. Uh, just imagine that in February when I joined, uh, just only nine countries was, were there. So we are trying to, to enlarge the boundaries in order to cover as far as possible all uh, geographic Europe countries. So no political issues, everyone is welcome. And uh, what you see here are just three keywords because in NOL we work together, in NOL we share, and in NOL we collaborate. Those keywords are common to anyone in this room, I'm sure. Uh, but for me, it's a surprise. I mean, I've been welcomed uh, by everyone so openly. And uh, the people in the room who know me uh, knows about my enthusiasm, but uh, it's not only just me. <laughs> you have to, to have people on the other side, and we have a lot of them. Um, what we are doing. so. The, the, first, the first thing that I'm sharing here is, uh, as you can see, we are working uh, uh, to share um, competences and skills that are already inside of the network. So one of the activities that we started is uh, the Under the Spotlight webinar series, where we have uh, those webinars uh, organized uh, by the NOL within the NOL network, but then shared openly, <laughs> of course, uh, in our YouTube channel, where our members share their expertise and share mainly which is their role uh, according to what's required in their institution around open education. In cases they are working also at other levels, for, for example, we are happy enough to have many members who are uh, involved in national uh, activities and international activities. They also share about this level of involvement, but the focus is the, the steps and the actions that the librarians can take in order to enlarge the open education uh, scenario in their libraries. So the idea is to um, share competences and uh, also talk about the struggles and uh, be open to uh, answer questions to people who are maybe newer to the field. And that's what happens in a very informal setting very easily. And uh, I would invite you to have a look at the two webinars that we already shared in, uh, in our uh, YouTube channel. What we are doing now is to prepare also uh, in parallel with other volunteers, of course, uh, open education drops. The idea here is to share very short videos uh, done again in an informal way and uh, with a very uh, welcoming attitude short videos that you can uh, enjoy while uh, taking a walk uh, when you need uh, to pause from your work or when you're drinking a nice coffee. So they are very short and they provide uh, short insight with uh, basic concepts at the beginning for sure uh, around open education. And the idea here is to help uh, other librarians who are not familiar with basic concepts to get in touch with them and maybe consider to join the open education movement. Those videos uh, at the present time, we have a free draft version done by different members. And the idea is to have them in more than one language. So we are, uh, um, we are, we are seeing that members are taking the lead in uh, translating and recording the videos in their own language. Then, then we need a short post uh, production activity to be done and we will share them in as many European languages as possible. Another activity that we are doing is to interview open education champions. And we have Katrin Cronin in the room. <laughs> and she is one of the champions that we just interviewed. I'm so really grateful because uh, she, she was great as always. And we are going to interview more. By the end of the year, we plan to have 12 to 15 interviews done and to, of course, share them openly. Because the idea here is to involve, uh, being a librarian network, involve champions who are working as teachers, instructional designers, decision makers, any other role uh, that dives into the open education scenario so that our librarians, but every librarian can benefit uh, from those videos, having insights from other perspectives. We can only build this together. 
And together is a keyword that comes to my mind quite often, thanks to the picture book done with the other people in this room. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Uh, the activity that I'm more proud of, it's been a real struggle to build the process here, and uh, we are going to share it openly as a practice, is uh, the work that we are uh, closing now around the sharing tools uh, that uh, uh, enlighten which are the open education benefits for different stakeholders. We've been working uh, with the students in mind, the teachers, mm -hmm. institutions, and the citizens at large so far. And we are also going to develop uh, benefits or to collect more than develop benefits for librarians. But so far, we've been working with uh, those four uh, target groups in mind. And what we are sharing very soon in October are uh, slide, slides, um, Twitter cards, and leaflets that uh, anyone will be for sure allowed to reuse and adapt. The idea here is the process uh, more than the result, because in the final result of uh, those uh, benefits tools, there will be no logo, no logo from Spark, no logo from the NOL. Our idea is that uh, the main result that we are going to share are the templates. Uh, and uh, our own version would be an adaptation of the template. So the NOL is providing templates that anyone can adapt changing the colors to their institutional ones, adding their logos, and uh, maybe tweaking the, the order of the benefits according to their institutional needs. So um, we think about librarians who need to print the leaflets and put them as posters in their libraries, or the need to have uh, uh, ready to be reused slides for their presentation, or Twitter cards that are already prepared and uh, ready to be used, or also adaptable. And uh, the focus here is not on having our best graphic version possible. The, the idea is to create a process in which the tool itself speaks about open education. It is built to be reusable. It is built to be as simple as possible so that anyone with no uh, proprietary license software can adapt them. And uh, there is no need to remove anything. You can just add your own uh, personality, your institution image, etc. And for sure, you can tweak the orders of every uh, benefit that you think might fit more for your target users. So this is uh, something that I'm really happy about. And members have been doing an hackathon also to uh, work on those lists. Uh, members also are looking up to create a learning path uh, for librarians. And uh, the preview of the infographic that you see here on the right is done by librarians, for sure. Um, and the, the idea here is to curate more than create, uh, curate a learning path for librarians around open education, providing them the best link that we can retrieve so far and adapting the content just when needed because we want it to be um, uh, very practically responded to the needs of librarians. But uh, we are not creating anything, we are mostly reusing and maybe adapting. And the idea is to provide something that is a quick tool to be reused and uh, it is always connected to the other tools that members are creating. And uh, we are going to share all the links to all our resources in a Wakelet page. Wakelet is an open tool, and uh, we have librarians, for sure, from the NOL, creating and curating the page there, where all the resources created by the NOL, all the resources adapted by the NOL, but also resources that librarians find to be very useful for their uh, work in order to enhance uh, the open education opportunities in their institutions are going to be shared here. And uh, it's gonna be public soon. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not hidden, to be honest, but it's something that we want to wrap up uh, at best during the October again. So you see, uh, many things are happening, but uh, what, I, what I would like to share with you, as I said at the beginning, it's a journey that we are doing together. And journeys don't come without challenges. The challenges are always there. Um, for example, not all members in our network are comfortable with taking action at the same time. So 
we needed to balance and to be patient and to coordinate uh, times and efforts and uh, to be ready to be in the in some other people's foot and uh, take action on their behalf when they need us. Um, and also, uh, sometimes it happens that they are not ready to actively contribute. So we are finding many different ways to enlarge the active members, member number, uh, so that people can always feel welcome, even if the contribution at the beginning can be very tiny, there's room in practice for any kind of contribution and members feel this. And this is really, really helpful to, to have them on board. And uh, well, the activities are increasing widely, I would say after summertime, we've been crazy busy because people are creating anything, you, you will see. And uh, also we have the language issue, which is something that is really, uh, common at global level, but sometimes it's not, uh, if you think about uh, networks, uh, in our case, English still is uh, the second language for most of the members, and some of them don't talk in English, so they need uh, in specific uh, uh, meetings, uh, interpreters or translators, and in other uh, moments, they need to have the transcripts to go back to the meetings and understand them properly. So we have to take care of all those issues. Uh, at the same time, this is really enriching because uh, facing these issues at the European level can be then uh, a practice that can be enlarged globally. So it's a very interesting uh, experience also this one. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, what helps us uh, uh, overcome these difficulties uh, uh, is mainly a welcoming approach and uh, a lot of patience with each other and uh, the attitude to listen, which was uh, really something that I noticed uh, all along uh, the last uh, uh, nine months or so. So I'm really happy to be with those people. And uh, <laughs> I think that we will continue to share, to negotiate and to pull efforts to, to do our best. We meet monthly, which is not, uh, uh, not um, I mean, it's a commitment for them, okay? Because uh, in between uh, every day's working agenda, it's not easy to find room for all the conferences and also all the meetings that you already have to manage on uh, in your working uh, schedule. But uh, people are there, and if they can't, they, they can't be there synchronously, they go back to the recordings that are always shared. So it's working, let's say. Um, what we are trying to do then is to build capacity. Every uh, academic librarian is welcome to join us. And uh, our next goal, together with sharing everything uh, in the next couple of months, starting from what members are creating, is to have uh, more countries represented. We are still looking toward many of the missing countries, and we really would like to be representative of all. And if we don't have a member, from other countries, it is difficult to understand their issues properly and to address them together. So uh, it's a call for uh, new members, let's say, okay? And that's it. I think that uh, I'm done <laughs> with this presentation. If you have questions, I'm here. Great, thank you very much, Paola. And that's uh, well within the time, so well done. <laughs> Um, are there any questions from the audience for Paola? I see one Sorry. from Catherine in the chat. I don't know if this oh, is, right. I, I see this, which is the last one maybe. For those who may not be in the network, uh, but wish to support your work, how can we do this? How can we help and support? Well, uh, <laughs> wonderful, Sarah is, uh, is uh, on the same, um, has the same question. So, um, First of all, write me uh, and uh, we will arrange a meeting. We can talk about this and we can find the best way to support the network. Catherine, you've been already very kind with us because your expertise shared in an interview is already uh, very helpful to have an overview. But again, if anyone wants to get in touch with us and you are not a librarian, but you are willing to collaborate, just write me an email 
and I'm going to write my my email address here in the chat so everyone can. Okay, and I also typed it correctly, which is not usual. <laughs> Any other questions from the room? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, while people are still thinking, uh, I actually have one question from my side, and I think this could be something that addressed by you, Paola, but also jointly perhaps with Sarah, considering that Sarah is also the dean of the libraries at, um, at her respective institution. So, what was the rationale, or what is the rationale for create? What was the rationale for creating the network of librarians, of open education librarians, right, in the first place? Like by focusing on librarians as the main Sort of stakeholder groups to drive open education or OER forward within respective institutions. Well, I'm I'm grateful for this question because uh, again, I am not a librarian and uh, I am mostly uh, um, as a profile. I am more an instructional designer and a project manager. Okay, so uh, um, working with open educational resources on a daily basis uh, uh, in practice. I, I know that I, uh, I have many gaps, skill gaps, okay? Because librarians have a different profile and uh, who better than librarians can help everyone who is creating open educational resources to uh, catalog them properly, to understand how to share them properly, how to organize them in a way that they are searchable and retrievable properly. Who can help you at best uh, to find the, the right image that you want to add to a video when you are unable to find it, or a paper that uh, supports you in motivating why it is important for you as a teacher, as a faculty member, to uh, properly share your results openly. And I think that uh, having librarians in the picture, and I was not there when the network was created, but in my imagination, being the OI Global again, the scenario, I imagine that they met there in Delft and they looked at each other saying, okay, we are not in this picture enough yet, at least at European level, okay? And uh, it was interesting for me to, to look at the documentation that uh, they collected in advance before I joined to see which was, how different it was their perspective on working on OER compared to mine and compared to the faculty members that I know are interested in open education. And uh, if I think about my role in Politecnico, I think that we would benefit enormously at the institutional level to support uh, um, uh, advocating for OER with the decision makers, having librarians on our side. So they are in the cross pathway. <laughs> they are really in the middle of everything that goes around open education. I really believe they are key. Great, that was a lovely contextualization. Thank you very much, Paola. Um, and uh, Sarah, would you like to add anything from your side? No, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> I was just asking, you know, can we get that as a, a soundbite and broadcast it? Um, because in trying to explain, um, I was just giving a, a talk yesterday to, um, it, was, it was at a lecture in our, in our honors college talking about open and all of the different components that go into it. And we really are, as librarians, we really are in the middle of it, looking at licensing um, licensing and fair use and media type, and then how you know users and learners can engage with the content afterward. And so you know, we're kind of stretched across all of these different areas and are wildly collaborative because of that. Um, because you know, I know, some instructional design, I know a lot about licensing, I know a lot about curation and formatting and whatnot, but for that depth, like a, we're so appreciative for the collaboration with other, um, other instructors and particularly instructional designers who know how to put together all of the content in a way that is, is formatted for an optimal learning experience because you can't be an expert in everything. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so it's it's where that the collaboration in these relationships and consortia and whatnot that are being developed are exactly where our hearts are at. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
Great, thank you very much, Sarah, as well. And by the way, just to address your question around the soundbite, so uh, the, the recording is going to be available uh, shortly after this session, so feel free to do your edits as well and just lift whatever you need. Thank you. There are some additional questions here or comments um, uh, from different uh, participants. Uh, I'm not sure if you would like to, to, to voice them directly here or if, Paola, you would like to just read through them at your leisure during the session. Oh, okay, thank you. Perhaps we can then address them also during the, during the bigger the discussion time. Uh, but I think that one of the sort of key takeaways here for people uh, to consider is that, that librarians are actually your uh, important allies and also in many respects drivers of open education efforts at different institutions. And here in, in this specific context, <clears throat> I think this is also important for those who are actually thinking of starting a specific open education initiatives in different institutions. So always think of the librarians, important allies. Uh, thank you very much. I think that we can now, uh, so congratulations, Paula. Thank you for your, for your presentation. And we are also looking forward to seeing your, the outputs that you were mentioning in your presentation that are going to be released sometimes in October, the various tools that you have been mentioning that would assist different stakeholder groups in advocating for open education. So thank you for that impactful overview and the meaningful work that you've been doing. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we can now move to the next presenter. So essentially with the next presentation, we are moving from the higher education sector to the K through to 12 sector or primary secondary education sector, just to be inclusive with the terminology here as well. We have here with us uh, Margreta Tweisme, who is from the Norwegian uh, digital learning arena. And she is going to be talking our shortly NDLA, and she's going to be talking about NDL, NDLA as a sustainable organizational model, right? So this is coming in the context of sustainability. And if I'm not mistaken, we also have the CEO of NDL, NDLA present with us here too. So welcome as well, Sigurd. And uh, please, um, Margreta, uh, you can proceed. Thanks a lot, Igor. Can you see my screen now? All right. Yes. Yeah, good. Yes. So um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I would like to, to have joined you all in France instead of being here, but it's okay <laughs> this way as well as a warming up to maybe France in, uh, in uh, May. Uh, okay. So I am going to talk about uh, the Norwegian digital learning arena. Uh, and to look at it as a sustainable organization model. Uh, so this action area about um, creating sustainable uh, models for OER, I have been pondering a bit about it when I've made this presentation and um, try to think about different ways of uh, looking at it and what it could be. And um, uh, I'm going to focus on this as um, on how we are organized. But I also think that towards the end of my presentation, I'm going to get into more other issues or other aspects of uh, sustainable OER. Let's see if I have the time at least. Uh, okay, so just a short uh, geography lesson. Here we are uh, uh, in Norway and I am on the Western coast of Norway. But uh, our organization, NDLA, is, is, is scattered across Norway. We are, don't have a main office anywhere. We work mostly digitally, and then we uh, see each other only uh, uh, a few times a year. And then we are very happy to see each other as well. So uh, we are a small country when it comes to inhabitants. And the one major point about Norway is that education is publicly funded. And I'll get back to that because that is important on how NDLA is organized. Uh, so what is NDLA? Well, it's, we could call it an OER repository and it's financed, governed and owned by the majority of the Norwegian counties. And you can see the counties here. Um, the counties of Norway, and um, we need to go into a very short history lesson as well, because in 2006, two very important things happened in Norway. Uh, Norway got a new curricula for K-12, 
uh, focusing on digital competencies and digital skills for the first time, the first curriculum actually mentioning digital skills uh, and digital literacy. Uh, so that was the one thing that was happening. And the other thing was that the government um, uh, decided that even though education had been publicly funded earlier as well, now it also should include textbooks and resources for upper secondary school, because upper secondary students had, they had bought their own textbooks until then. Uh, but now that was also going to be free. Uh, and the responsibility for, for providing them with their resources was given to the counties as they also had the responsibility of, uh, uh, of providing the education, the upper secondary education. Uh, so then uh, with those two things in mind, the counties decided to make the uh, Norwegian Digital Learning Arena as a means of both uh, providing learning resources for free and uh, to uh, enhance digital skills and digital competencies. Uh, so that was kind of the start of uh, the NDLA. And today, um, this is uh, just some numbers. Uh, we have uh, more than 140 subjects uh, for upper secondary students. We have approximately 25,000 learning resources. Uh, and last year we peaked uh, uh, when it came to visits. Not, I guess a lot of websites concerning school did that last year because of the pandemic, but the, the numbers have stayed very high for us. Uh, and uh, every day about 60 to 90,000 people visit us a bit. Uh, changing a bit about which day it is and which time of year it is. Um, this is a typical page on our website. Um, uh, it's uh, most of our material uh, is organized into subjects, but you will also find some interdisciplinary cases. And you will also find a toolbox um, where you can find things like how to tutorials, mostly like how to make a great presentation and how to work with the social environment in your classroom and so on and so on. Um, early on uh, in our history, there was a lot of text, um, but these days we have moved to a much richer content with a lot of interactive resources, a lot of simulations, videos, and also the tasks have changed to becoming more uh, encouraging the active learner uh, and the active student. Uh, so, so there is a lot of uh, new tasks uh, that are more not, not that much of what did I just read, uh, but more active uh, and uh, research questions. Uh, yes, I'm also uh, just uh, do a bit of a uh, um, uh, just uh, mention that H5P, if you're interested in using H, uh, H5P to make interactive resources, you could look up my good colleague's uh, presentation on that, uh, which I also have linked uh, underneath my presentation sites uh, on the platform. Um, yep, then we are where we were supposed to be. This is the main point today. So this model uh, shows um, different schools in Norway uh, and different teachers in Norway. So our model of organization is that if you work as a teacher in upper secondary school in Norway, you can come to work for NDLA for a period of time. So you don't quit your job as a teacher, you just take leave of it for a while and then uh, uh, you come to work for us. And then after a year or two years or three years, depending on what you do in our organization, uh, you go back to your school. Uh, and this uh, I have called a sustainable flow of competency. And what I mean by that is that this ensures that in our organization, we get new uh, teachers with a fresh experience from the classroom 
into our organization that have recently been there with the pupils and know what's going on uh, and, uh, and have kind of the pulse of the classroom with them as they come in. And that is really important when you're making learning resources for, for pupils. Um, and then when they get back, they take the competency they have gained in NDLA back into their schools. And that competency can uh, differ quite a lot. Uh, most teachers work with making resources into subjects uh, in, our, uh, in NDLA. Uh, for instance, a history teacher will make resources in history. But also we have some specialized uh, uh, departments in NDLA, for instance, working with quality checks, working with ensuring that we have a universally designed resources, um, that uh, the quality of our pictures is okay and our videos, uh, that the language is proper and correct and so on and so on. And we also have uh, a department working with uh, user experience, and that is both developing uh, our uh, web page, but also testing our resources uh, for teachers and students, uh, going to schools, school supply to be a test school for us, and then they go there and test resources. So we make sure that uh, teachers and students uh, find them useful and interesting. So, uh, so there are very lots of the different types of competency that, uh, that our co-workers get and that they bring into school again. So in this uh, flow, this circular flow, we don't drain the schools of their best teachers that they never see again. Uh, they, can, they get back and they, uh, they share what they've learned. And also, as I said, uh, we get fresh. Uh, impulses from school. And some of them, quite a lot of them actually is, um, work part-time and LA and part-time as teachers at their schools. So that is also a very good combination for us. And they stay at their school all the time. As I said earlier, they, we don't have a main office. So they just stay at the school. They have their work best at school as they work with NLA as well. So that is also a way that they um, maintain the contact with the school. Um, yes, so that is, is the model. And I'm also going to say a few words about governance because I think that also is hugely important uh, for the sustainability of our organization. The fact that we are publicly funded um, by the counties um, ensures that we are closely in touch with the Norwegian democracy, the politicians on county level. Um, uh, and we have this governing committee, which is made up of these politicians as well as county officials. Uh, and they are the ones that decide what we are going to do in NDLA, how we could spend our money and how much money we will get and so on and so on. Uh, and, and this, cooperation with, with the, uh, the democratic institutions uh, make sure that what we make is uh, uh, what people want us to make. And also that public money is of course spent on public service, uh, which I think is hugely important. Uh, I, have, I have been, uh, my salary has come from taxpayers money all my life. And I think that that kind of, uh, you need to treat that fact with a lot of respect. I think you need to make sure that what you do is worthwhile and, and that you, you really are doing public service. So, and when we, and make our resources, they stay in the open, they stay in the public domain as they are licensed with uh, an open license, all of it. So this is, uh, this is really uh, an issue when it comes to making it sustainable, I think. Um, yeah, let's see. What challenges do we face in Norway as uh, provider or open and educational resources for upper secondary students. Well, Norway is very much, Norway is a very modern country, but it's very much into the old paradigm of educational resources as a scarce commodity. Uh, um, so that 
and you have to pay for it and you have if you pay a lot of money for it then it's probably good that quality and price are linked together um, and uh, open educational resources especially our resources is seen as a threat to the traditional publishers um, uh, and the general understanding of open licensing in Norway is low so that there are other ways of uh, compensating for instance uh, illustrators that we pay them properly one time and then it's open and free it's um, they are very skeptical towards that type of of pay payment models um also um when you combine this skepticism um and the publishers lobby and the politicians uh, then you have a, a rather potent mix and it comes up again and again this criticism that we make uh, resources of poor quality and uh, that we are uh, threatening uh, the publishers businesses and when we are as i said and i looked upon it as a very positive thing linked to democracy and uh, democratic uh, democratical institutions we are also very vulnerable to to political changes of mind so if the politicians decide uh, that we are uh, not in fact worthwhile uh, spending money on then we are out of business and we don't exist anymore so that is of of course a constant uh, good in, in one way because we are challenged by it and we need to make good resources but also a constant um, threat and I would very much like to see a much broader public debate in Norway on open licensing and open resources that would be very welcome and we hope that we can contribute to such a debate in the future. Uh, what else, uh, what are we thinking? in the future and now i get to the part where i where i think a bit about other ways of looking at sustainability when it comes to oer um you all know this uh the five hours of open education of course and um the fact is that um this these five hours are very much um possible to to use when it comes to our resources you can do all this with our resources we had have, have a very uh open license on them and uh but it doesn't happen that much it doesn't use that way the teachers doesn't use it this way they don't they don't remix they don't uh, revise our resources they take them as they are and use them as they would a textbook article in their classes and the students also treat them as the same way as they would uh, that kind of of material so uh, we are thinking we need to do something about that to kind of heighten the level of, of um, knowledge and understanding of what you can do with our resources and why it is good for learning. And what we are working on now is a more personalized uh, experience so that you can get a choice to log on uh, to our web page. You don't have to, you will never have to log on because it's supposed to be open to all, but you get the choice to do it and then you will be able to kind of bookmark resources, find your favorite subjects and so on and so on. And you will also get to use a platform for collaboration with other teachers and other students. And I think if we can make such a platform work with where teachers can show each other what they do with our resources and how they put them together, maybe that will increase uh, um, the sustainability of the resources and uh, the way they can be used. And uh, also the, the knowledge about the five hours of open education. And then this is this, this is more uh, into the future. This is, we don't have any concrete um, projects going on on this uh, as uh, speaking today, but our platform technology is open. It's open so you can take it and use it. And we like to say that, but it's not quite true because uh, it's not the code is not well documented enough for anyone to just go there and take it as it is today. Um, so we need to, to make sure that our code is 
not only open, but also reusable. Uh, so that it, it's really true that you can take our platform code and make your own platform out of it, uh, which we would very much like to see. And then I think we are really talking about sustainability because then we are talking about uh, not having to spend a lot of resources around the world making platform technology, uh, but that you can take this for free that we have already spent money on and make your own resources and make your own platform that is adapted to your local conditions. Um, so this is something that we would really like to see. And I think this type of collaboration and this type of sharing, uh, then we're really talking about sustainability. So uh, as Paula Paolo also was uh, into, this is, uh, uh, I think this is the way to go. You need to, we need collaboration. We need more uh, collaboration. And um, that is why we are here today as well. And it, that is really the key for, to further uh, sustainable development of OER. I think um, sharing what we have and truly sharing technology as well, sharing the tools of making it happen. Um, yeah. So uh, that was really what I wanted to, to share with you today. So thank you uh, so much. And uh, we'll stop with a picture of my colleagues. Uh, and you can see how happy we are when we finally get together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Margreta. Really appreciate it. Uh, just a couple of remarks from my side. Uh, well, first of all, I'm a big fan of NDLA. So thank you for coming here today together with your colleagues and sharing your experiences. Uh, I absolutely love your uh, sustainable flow of competency approach that you described in your presentation. It's fantastic. Um, and also, actually, it was interesting for me to see how you articulated the challenges um, that you face, because I can actually assure you with quite some, um, um, uh, I can assure you that the same type of challenges actually resonate across the higher education sector as well. And I think that many of the participants here can attest to that. Um, the, 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 the collaboration aspect uh, that you mentioned in your last slide, and you mentioned that that's actually why we are here. Would you be able to maybe specify what kind of collaboration you are seeking? Well, it, uh, we would, it would be nice to have friends working with the same thing. Just uh, uh, that is kind of the large picture, right? Because okay. as it's much what Paula addressed, right? uh to get support and to to kind of get to the nourishment that you need that what you do is is really is, is important and it's, it's it's probably changing the world ahead and and that types of things but also technology for instance h5p technology um that where we are developing a uh, new types of a new tasks a new task types, for instance, escape rooms these days. And we need a community, a larger community to do, to work with us and share their tasks because um, it's expensive to develop this type of, um, of tasks uh, or this type of technology. And, 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 but if we could have uh, an international community working on it, that would be really, really great. So. Uh, that is one thing. And also, if someone really was interested in our platform technology, well, then we had to kind of start working with the code and maybe some people would like to help us with you to do that so that we could uh, share our platform with everyone. Um, so that would be one collaboration. But I also think that, think that if schools in Norway could, for instance, work with translations of uh, of our uh, material in in issues where that's uh, globally interesting for for instance science if if they could translate into spanish spanish french english and then put them online uh, to share that would also be a lovely way of learning languages and a lovely way of of collaborating with others maybe uh, yeah that's just some ideas that i have maybe sigur and johannes have other things they they could add to that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Margreta. I really appreciate it. And I would actually also like to note at this point in time that we are addressing another area of the UNESCO ER recommendation, which is international collaboration or cooperation strategies. 
right? This was addressed by Paula as well and by you as well, Margareta. So thank you for doing that. There are numerous comments in the chat, uh, complimentary okay. remarks, appreciation uh, remarks, and uh, there are also some questions. So we will take a few now, we still have some time. So the first one is coming from Sarah Hutton. Um, she says, I would be interested to hear more about the metrics assessment tools used, used to determine whether materials are useful or learning is taking place. Yes, I can. I think I can answer that one. Um, when we test, um, we have not got any great methods for testing um the learning measuring the learning that comes out of it really so it's more on a and uh on a quality level if i can if i can use that word that uh, we we interview the pupils afterwards or a few of them uh, and in a qualitative matter right so so it was we, what did you think? Uh, what did you get out of it? And they say things like, well, this movie was very okay, but it was very much too long. And I almost fell asleep uh, during the end and things like that. Or the teachers will say, well, this is very useful, but you should uh, include questions about this and this and this. So it's it's much more on that level. So, so really learning measurement, we don't do that as for now, but maybe we will in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Margareta. There is another question from Ulster, who is asking, has there been any discussion of expanding NDLA into higher education? I assume that's in Norway then, or setting up a similar organization uh, for that purpose? Sigurd, would you like to say something about that? <clears throat> yes, uh, uh, there are a few initiatives on OER in the, in the university level. It, it's, I think, that's more like the one we hear about at this conference. Uh, in the universities are trying to support the teachers in different ways in order to create uh, OER resources for sharing. Uh, but I think uh, what Margareta mentioned uh, in the start, the legislation that uh, put the responsibility on the school owner to supply the students with free materials in, uh, in upper secondary is not the same. So you don't have this uh, mechanism in a, in a university level. And that's probably why there are no such uh, uh, national initiatives. Uh, but they are trying to, to create teacher communities for sharing resources uh, in a university level. There has been discussion at the one to ten uh, level in uh, in Norway, but there are uh, a couple of uh, municipalities. So the organization model, as uh, Andele has put up, is uh, much more complicated. And also, there is a fight from the private sector uh, trying to uh, stop uh, such an initiative that's going on in Norway. It's it's a small market, and uh, the, the the book companies or the private sector is uh, afraid of uh, their uh, uh, the total supplies of learning materials. If uh, an NDLA for the one to ten is uh, will be born, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> yes, but but this mechanism that you don't have in the universities, I think that's an important. Very, very important factor for the sustainability of NDLA. Uh, yes. Mm. And there was also a question about the uh, budget uh, for the downstream. And uh, we could say that the uh, NDLA is funded with approximately 9 million euros a year. So it's a quite uh, su substantial uh, budget. And the sustainability is also due to counties that is very has been very decided on. This is something that we will do uh, on a yearly basis. But we our cut of the total uh, budget for learning resources are about uh, uh, 15, 20 percent. So the counties spend the rest buying uh, learning resources, digital learning resources and uh, textbooks in the open market. 
And also we could say that we have approximately 200,000 students in upper secondary school in Norway. And if we divide our budget on those, uh, those numbers or more precise on 160,000 students that are <laughs> in the county's member, uh, there is an annual bill for each student approximately 50 euros a year. And for this uh, sum of money, we have this, these 140 subjects and uh, we have maybe six, seven subjects for, for one third of the students because it depends on what kind of subjects we have. So we think it's uh, uh, the model also has proved to deliver a quality for a, a reasonable sum uh, of money. You can go and buy one textbook in Norway for the same price. It figures around the economy. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for that explanation, Sigurd. Um, <clears throat> so I think, well, we ran out of time for the Q&A at this point in time. So I would like to thank again, Margreta and also now Sigurd for your contributions to this conversation. Thank you. And for everyone else who is present here, if you have any additional questions as they keep brewing in your head, uh, please put them into the chat window and we will make sure to address them in the, in the discussion session afterwards, okay? Thank you very much. We can now move to the other presentation, uh, which is going to be done jointly by uh, Sarah Hutton and Max uh, Mahmoud Varde. Uh, they are both located, um, well, Sarah is located in uh, University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst and um, Max is um, located within the Open Knowledge Collective uh, in the United Kingdom. And their, presence, they, their presentation is actually also positioned within the sustainability models for OER, which is the UNESCO OER recommendation area. But here they are actually, well, here it is mostly a slight, it's, it's a slightly different issue, I think. Um, but well, often when we are talking about sustainability in the context of OER or open education initiatives, the, the discussions tend to center on sort of funding model or lack of funding, right? Uh, but another important component to consider here is how those initiatives can be sustained through the work of sort of often volunteer communities in a way or networks. Um, and as we also heard, there can be more formal networks as, as Paula has been speaking about or as was addressed through ND NDLA as well. But there is potentially a danger uh, of these networks if they are not open or inclusive enough. And this can have some implications on the sustainability of those efforts as a result. So I hope that I got it right in terms of your intentions. And I would like now to give you space uh, to, to do your presentation a bit. So please, Sarah and Max, proceed. Okay, great, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can you see all right? No, yes? Yes, yes, we can see that, yeah. Okay, great. All right, take it away, Max. Okay, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Igor, yeah, that, thanks for the intro. And thanks everybody for joining us uh, in this session. So our presentation is going to be about the, the rich, what we call the rich club phenomenon and its impact on knowledge production communities um, and the commons. And uh, as Igor said, I'm Max. I'm the founder of the Open Knowledge Connective. And actually, as of tomorrow, I'll also be the technical lead of the Internet Production Alliance. Um, so uh, hopefully, yeah, you can look it up. It's a very interesting project. <laughs> and I hope I'll see some of you in that context uh, at some point in the future as well. Yeah, so exciting. Um, and I'm Sarah Hutton. Uh, I know some of us have met before. Um, I'm the Dean of Libraries at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And, oh, here we go. <laughs> so we're gonna be talking about, as Max said, the Rich Club coefficient um, and community building in the Knowledge Commons network. So the Knowledge Commons should, at its heart, be an act of this community development. Um, and in this conversation, we'll be discussing this phenomenon known as the rich club effect and how it might be shaping the communities that are being built around the production of knowledge in the commons. Yeah, so um, what do we mean by the rich club phenomenon? Um, the rich club phenomenon describes um, a phenomenon basically where contributors with a high number of collaborators 
are likely to cooperate with other well-connected individuals. Um, and we first came across this research um, on the effects of this kind of rich club behavior, um, as it, especially as it relates to the knowledge commons in the work of Gasparini et al, which we've linked to there at the bottom of that slide. Um, uh, and um, in their research, what they did is they unpacked the impact of this rich club phenomenon on open source projects. And they did this by analyzing a data set related to the 100 most popular projects on GitHub, which is a popular platform for hosting open source software projects. And they explored the connectivity uh, patterns in the social graph structure of the collaborations in these projects. Um, and by social graph, it means just, you know, sort of that the, the, the graph of connections between collaborators. Um, and the findings of their research indicate that the presence or absence of what's known as the rich club, um, and this is measured by something called the rich club coefficient, which is the degree to which this uh, phenomenon manifests. So, you know, if you have a high rich club coefficient, then the phenomenon, phenomenon is, is, is highly manifested, essentially, and vice versa. Um, and they found that this coefficient basically has an impact on the sustainability and robustness of the project, of, of any of the projects that they analyzed. So um, this is the comparison of two of the projects in this particular study that um, Max was referring to. So that this coefficient variation in correlation to project sustainability is shown between the materialized project, which is on the left. Um, it's a CSS framework um, based on material design. It has a high rich club coefficient and the collaborations graph for the Swift programming language project shown on the right has a lower rich club coefficient. So you can see um, how the interactions are mapped differently between the two based on whether or not that coefficient is high or low. And so going into a little more depth on the materialized project, which has that high coefficient, um, it was the project established in 2014 by a team of four developers um, and it has over 3,800 commits, 252 contributors. However, over 1,000 of those commits belong to just two of the top contributors. And you can see that um, manifestation of that in these two nodes that have, you know, the dark red with a collection of more, like there's just more threads of connectivity between all of them. And so those members of the original team, you know, are connected with most of the commits. And so this project is still clearly owned by its original founders, as opposed to the SWIFT project, which has a lower coefficient. Um, it, was, it was a project that started in 2010, and it was publicly announced by Apple in 2014 and open sourced in 2015. It has more than 84,000 commits, 674 contributors with 14 top, and that means 1,000 plus um, commits. Um, contributors and 44 frequent, and that's between 100 and 1,000 commits, um, more than uh, 44 frequent contributors. So four of the top contributors are not affiliated with Apple, so not a affiliated with the original founder of the project, indicating that this project has attracted and retained a broader diversity of contributors. Um, and so you can see here too, if you recall materialized with those two like cluster nodes, like this one is much broader um, and still like a stronger connectivity between all contributors. So um, looking at them again, sort of side by side, <clears throat> you can see that if there's no rich club in the sense that, you know, you've got a low coefficient, which is the Swift project um, uh, on the left there, um, then what was found is that the, in, and this is how it relates to governance essentially, is that the project maintainers have to make sure the project information still flows to all members because you don't really have these contributors who are considered sort of strong nodes in the network. It means that the information in the network is much more diffuse. So the challenge then becomes to make sure that everybody in the network actually knows what's going on. Um, and on the other hand, if you have a high rich club coefficient, such as with materialized, which is the example on the right, then governance policies have to be put in place to guarantee that you don't end up with this sort of clustering of decision making where important decision decisions um, that require broad community participation actually find a way of drawing in the community and you don't end up with these sort of um, 
uh, essentially centralized decision making by these sort of um, well connected individuals. Um, and so, you know, what, what tends to sort of bring it back to the definition of the phenomenon, what, what would tend to happen if you're not careful is that those four sort of nodes will just end up talking to each other and excluding the rest of the community to make key decisions. Um, and these are two examples that can hopefully show you that this is the kind of phenomenon that can have a really direct impact on nurturing the creation of inclusive sustainability models in the production of the knowledge commons. I mean, any kind of open knowledge um, uh, project, um, whether it's software or, or, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So this phenomenon is nothing new. And one of the reasons why we wanna bring it to the attention of folks who are working in open is that um, we're seeing this, this rich club phenomenon, which has appeared and been discussed much earlier on in academia, we're seeing that being replicated um, in open projects. So looking at research that was conducted um, in traditional academic publishing and how institutional and researcher status impacts funding, there's a study that we've linked here and it's also on a, a pub site we'll share later on. Um, Sal and Sinatra discussed those social relations and dynamics within, the science, within scientific research in a 2015 study of this rich club effect, this phenomenon on fund allocation in scientific research. So they found that there was a distinct correlation between funded projects and institutional status. This is no surprise um, for those of us who do you know, research, whether it's in you know, science, um, other scholarly publishing areas, you have you know, those familiar institutional names, um, which I, I won't name because I don't want to call anyone out directly, but um, the better funded institutions are heavy hitters in publishing. And it was, it's, it's been researched for a long time in academia. Um, again, you know, the higher the reputation of the university, whether it's due to, you know, social or financial capital, the more funding they would continue to receive. So it would just, you know, grow that coefficient over time. So why does this matter? Um, it's been going on for a long time. Why does it matter? Um, we see some of the biggest problems that are, are facing us currently that we're, that we're researching um, and developing projects about educating about climate change, environmental degradation, food insecurity. These issues are disproportionately affecting the very same people and populations um, that have traditionally been excluded from institutions of knowledge production. So this is in um, you know, private public sector, academia, everywhere. Uh, this is inequity. Yeah, and so those of us that are taking part in this event, um, of course, appreciate the role that developing the knowledge commons can play in mitigating a lot of these issues that Sarah mentioned and solving a lot of the resulting problems. Um, but it's really important that those of us who are involved in the building of the knowledge commons um, take into account the existence of this rich club phenomenon and in, in the networks of collaborations that we're building um, and through which we're producing this knowledge. And we feel that just understanding the effects of having both high or low coefficient rich clubs within these networks can help project maintainers mitigate the effects of this sort of rich club phenomenon in how the knowledge is being produced in their projects by ensuring equitable and inclusive contributions. Just to reiterate the, the two points um, that we've made, you know, we've been talking about this rich club coefficient and we don't want there to be that automatic assumption that like it, it exists and it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, um, it exists. And again, as Max was saying, we just want to bring it into the conversation. Um, you know, the high and low, like the, it's more about governance and bring it into the consciousness of conversation and in managing these open collaborations um, in knowledge production. So the first point is we wanna highlight the barriers that exist in these collaborative projects um, that are concerned with the production of knowledge and participation in, in open projects. And these, these barriers have the, the potential to prevent a more inclusive and diverse range of contributions. And so we need to be mindful not to replicate these barriers in open projects. And that has a lot to do with communication, uh, governance models, 
um, and you know, more participatory governance models and conversations about how to maintain that open dialogue. Yeah, and, and the second point um, is that even when we sort of solve that first problem, even when we have networks of contributors that are more inclusive, we still need to be aware of the impact of this phenomenon, of the rich club phenomenon, so that we can reduce its effects, regardless of whether the project we're working on has a high or rich, uh, or low, sorry, rich club coefficient. And project maintainers need to keep in mind the rich club coefficient when they're reviewing contributions from, uh, from the community so that they can prevent the replication of the sort of the negative effects of high rich club coefficient projects, which can create a lot of barriers uh, because of sort of the centralization of decision making. Um, and at the end of the day, any kind of knowledge creation project has some kind of inherent value judgment about contributions in terms of the quality of the contributions. And project maintainers have to strike this balance between ensuring that the contribution that they're assessing is relevant to the project um, and, you know, and useful to the project on the one hand, but also not creating these sort of artificially high barriers to contribution on the other. And in this context, sort of the maintainers into institutional cult culture and the understanding of things like credentialing, for example, especially in an academic context, can establish a lot of biases. And these kinds of systemic biases can exclude contributions from these underrepresented groups who have been systemically prevented from gaining these kinds of credentials that are necessary to be welcomed into these kind of academic projects, as well as uh, sometimes even into sort of non-academic peer-to-peer production spaces. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, going back to the, you know, the the quality piece that that Max was just referring to. I mean, this was discussed a little bit. Um, when we were talking about NDLA is that, that that quality assurance is very important, especially in um, you know, the development of open content. And many of us have been involved in you know, developing um, open educational resources or teaching materials. And so that, that assessment of quality is essential. But again, like you don't wanna make it so stringent that it then excludes people to participating due to that credentialing process. And so, you know, in my experience as an educator um, and researcher and student and librarian, you know, many different roles, um, you know, what does that, that decent sort of balance look like? And one of the areas that I have um, experienced, one of the areas where I've experienced like a, a, good, a good balance um, in the development of open educational resources is in the Rebus community. And some folks are maybe familiar with this. Um, it's, you know, in the, in the development of open educational resources, educational content, there is a tendency for those smaller groups of content experts developing materials. Um, and there's less of a focus on inviting in contributions from the wider community because you have content and subject experts who are the ones authoring these textbooks um, and these ancillary materials that are, you know, teaching um, a particular subject in depth. Um, however, you can, through that thoughtful consideration and that governance of balancing content contribution and quality control and review, while maintaining that open invitation, um, you, can, you can maintain that. And so I found as an, an author and an editor in, in texts created by the Rebus community, I, that's a good balance. Um, so, this community is supported by the William and, Hewlett, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, for those who aren't familiar. And because it's supported by a foundation, they're not affiliated with any specific institution per se. Um, and so that helps to diffuse some of that, you know, clustering around um, an institution with greater social and financial capital. Um, the peer review process is transparent and open and all the materials are published openly online. It's a very open and transparent process. And you know, in particular, like there are these calls to contribute, um, uh, you know, and brainstorm and, and exchange and meet up. Um, it's it's a very open project. Um, and that being said, you know, one of the questions I would ask folks to consider in contributions to these types of projects: how open is too open? <laughs> when you're when you're creating educational content, especially if you're mapping to particular competencies or standards, you know. Do you think that oh, the development of some of this, these curriculum materials would suffer from too many cooks in the kitchen um, 
uh, having too many folks like trying to, to drag the content in too many different directions, that's something else to consider as well. Um, one of the pieces that we see potentially missing in this, and um, this, it might just be the semantics of language, um, is that there isn't you know, a, a call for consumers of content to participate in the conversation. Um, you know, we were wondering if it's the exchange component, but also, you know, to make it more participatory across different languages and understanding, you know, would it be better to change the way that the language is framed to broaden that invitation? Um, yeah, so uh, what we're sort of what we're doing with with this um, with this presentation is is really um, hoping that that is going to start be the start of a dialogue. And what we'd like to do is to invite any kind of project maintainer, in it, whether you're working on an open uh, an OER project, um, an open scholarship project, um, open data, or or open source software. Even um, I think the NDLA's sort of uh, software call for contributions if it was very interesting in that context. Um, then you know what we're doing is inviting uh, you to. Um, uh, basically join this conversation. We've created a form online that there's a link to there and we'll provide uh, another link uh, um, at the end of this uh, presentation as well. And what we'd like to do really is um, sort of explore this um, concept of the sort of intersection of sustainability, inclusiveness, and these governance models and how they can affect this. Um, and what we'd like to do is really just sort of start to aggregate these responses and um, create a, a longitudinal conversation essentially about about this uh, this idea. And so we have this, um, and I'll just open up the live pub. Let's hope this works. <laughs> it's always a risk. Um, so this is our, our open um, publication. It's on it's on PubPub. And as Max was just mentioning, you know, this is the place where we pose those questions to help facilitate a longitudinal conversation. Um, and so the questions that Max was just referring to, we have embedded here is a Google form. We invite any of you um, and any of our colleagues at the other events that we've presented this concept at to answer these questions. Um, just more about, you know, how can we open up the contributions to knowledge reduction? Um, we invite people to, um, you know, talk about different projects they've been involved with where they have noted a rich club coefficient, whether high or low, and just you know, some of those, um, some of those experiences that we share as colleagues participating in open development. And our, our intent, you know, as Max said, is to establish this like ongoing dialogue. And so within this publication, um, here's today's event, session details, and we'll type up the takeaways after this and some of the responses to the form in aggregate. Um, we have discussed this topic at the Creative Commons Global Summit this year and at the International Association for the Study of the Commons, Knowledge Commons Virtual Conference as a part of a panel. And so as we continue the conversation, we're going to be including, you know, these are the folks that were a part of the discussion. This is some of the stuff that we talked about and welcoming people to contribute their thoughts to that, to really just make this a long conversation that we can carry across um, you know, geographies, time, um, and spaces. And the intent is really to use this discussion as a way to dismantle some of these barriers with the emergent themes that we see from this ongoing research. Um, I'm gonna go back to, hey, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, just one minute, you've got one minute left. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, um, uh, that's it really, our presentation. There's a, a link there with, it's just a simple page with a, with a form. It's like a general feedback form. Of course, we've got the, the pub that uh, Sarah just uh, mentioned for the sort of the more detailed um, uh, responses. But if you just wanted to get in touch, then that's the greatest. It's just visit that URL and, and, uh, fill, in, and fill in the form um, and let us uh, know how you'd like to engage with us on this. Yeah. So there, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> oh no, there, I can change that. <laughs> so there goes my, I'm gonna stop sharing oh. it. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much, uh, Sarah and Max. I uh, really appreciate you bringing this sort of rich club phenomenon to the attention of the attendees here. I think that it was in some way, you issued a warning, uh, something that people really need to be um, mindful of and, and considered about. Um, and uh, I really like your invitation for people to participate. So thank you for sharing all of these resources too. And by the way, I think, well, the, this particular framework probably has got applicab applicability across a range of different contexts. Uh, but I mean, that's a, that's a larger discussion probably that we would have to spend more time on. Uh, please uh, update those uh, those relevant links also on, under your session on OEG Connect. That would be appreciated. Thank you very much. And uh, we have got time for a few questions here. So I would like to just, um, okay. So there was one question from, uh, from Chrissy and she was asking like, how does the rich club uh, behavior differs from clicks? And uh, well, the clicks is, if I understand properly, like a group that is kind of tightly controlled and does not let someone easily in. So I think she's asking about the difference between clicks and the rich club phenomenon. Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that is, um, I, I, one of the, I think one of the important things about sort of this rich club phenomenon is that it is, it is a, it's a phenomenon of human social networks. So I think it, it manifests in a lot of different ways. I think sometimes it can manifest as cliques, you know, and, 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 in different sort of, it can be given different names. And I think, um, Part of it is also, and I think this is one of the things that we re we'd really like to emphasize is again, it, you know, there's no sort of value judgment in whether a project having a high or a low rich club coefficient is good or bad. It's just that if you if you're paying attention to what the topology of your network looks like, uh, you need to know how that affects um, your interaction with your community of contributors and as well as the decision making within your community and i think the, the way that in my mind this relates a lot to sustainability and perhaps the you know development of cliques is in a lot of open projects for example when it comes to the way they're funded um quite often these sort of nodes in the network tend to be the people who are getting either paid salaries to be able to work full or part-time on a project so it depends you know the sustainability model itself and the, the funding model can create these kinds of um cliques essentially and that can become sort of hardwired into the way the network operates. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's just that you really need to be paying attention to this and to know how you can mitigate its effects in terms of the community and the contributors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I'm sorry, I've been looking at the questions too, and there are so many different interrelated threads. But I mean, yeah, going back to, there is no value judgment. I mean, the, the Rich Club coefficient really is just a formula. And so it's, it's a way to bring into conversation how these social networks cluster. And one of the things that um, I'm doing on the, on the pub site is compiling this list of resources to read more about how this phenomenon manifests and how that coefficient is applied in other conversations outside of open project development to show that like, this is just how things collect. I mean, even, you know, mapping networks and synaptic connections in the brain, the rich club coefficient can be applied. And so it's really just a tool and mechanism to facilitate a conversation about the necessity to look at how this happens in open projects and discuss better communication and governance models that can help to kind of untangle and unpack some of that before it causes issues. Thank you. Uh, so we can, I think, well, there, there's quite a lot of buzz happening here right now. So, but I think we can have take another question or two. Uh, so, well, Chrissy has another question, but you have already answered that in terms of writing up some materials around the topic, which you have already shared with us too. And uh, there was a question from pa Paula here. How do we balance the need to, to fasten decisions or to make decision making faster, uh, making processes and avoiding the reduction in the number of nodes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's and that's where more on the governance comes into play. I've talked about this a lot with Max and some of the open software development projects that are in library land, particularly within the future of libraries <laughs> is open project or folio. I know that for some people that'll make them shudder, 
um, because it's um, a very complex governance model and it's an ongoing conversation, you know, where you have technical counsel, product counsel, community counsel, and the intent is to have it be an open conversation, but you still have difficulties in connecting points of view. It slows down conversation, slows down development. And so it really is this balancing act of, you know, how much conversation and, and discussion and, you know, part of that, you know, democratic process is enough to move forward. And it could be based on like, you know, in order to meet the needs of your stakeholders or your constituencies or, or whatever, but how much is enough before you just kind of like basically talk the thing to death and then you're, it never gets released. I mean, that's what a lot of us are looking at. Like we have deadlines for development releases um, and we have to meet also different, you know, curriculum standards and different government standards or institutional standards. So it really is like this very delicate balancing act. And the conversation that we're trying to have is where do you see so, you know, beneficial governance models in your open projects? Let's start collecting them together in this long discussion to see if there is something that we can map out that is useful for all of us in many different situations where it has that flexibility to move fast or slow depending on context. Mm. If I may just quickly sort of pick up on that point that uh, as well is that I think um, what we've imagined is, is sort of being able to create this kind of taxonomy of, of, of governance models. And so, I mean, anybody who has any knowledge of any research, for example, that they can share with us and, and, and so we can share with, in, within this conversation, it would be great so that, you know, you can actually start to understand that if this is what your network looks like, then these are the kinds of governance models that you might want to be looking at. And creating that kind of mapping would be, would, I mean, that would be sort of the ideal scenario that we that we can imagine. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so thank you again to both Sarah and to Max for your presentations and for answering those questions. We have uh, reached our time limit for Q and A. So in the meantime, I encourage you all to please, well, specifically Sarah and and Max to 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 scan through the different comments and questions in the chat. If we do have time at the end of all the presentations, we can still address some additional points. But um, we can now move to the next presentation. So thank you very much again, uh, Sarah and Max. Well done, and thank you to everyone for your active participation. Now I would like to invite uh, Leo Hauman and Javier Atenas to take the center stage. Uh, well, so both Javier and, and Leo are going to be discussing a topic that is relevant for another UNESCO OER recommendation area, and that's developing supportive OER policies, both at institutional and governmental levels. And uh, well, Javier is now based at the University of Suffolk in the UK, and, and Leo is based at the University College London, UK. Uh, well, they both have got so much expertise and experience in the sort of open education policy space and not just the open education policy space, also open data space that we would have to spend quite a bit of time here discussing it. But yes, they have got lots of experience and they've been participating and driving in, dif in dif different initiatives in this regard and, and published quite widely on that as well. Uh, recently, they have also been, they published a fairly large publication on open education policies uh, that use um, guidelines for co-creation, so using co-creation as, as, a, as, a, as a framework of action uh, when people work on open education policies. And they've also been leading the Open Education Policy Lab activities. And uh, here uh, in today's session, uh, they are going to be giving us an overview of the state of open education policies uh, where we are at the moment uh, with a presentation entitled Landscapes, Maps and Territories of Open Education Policy. Where do we go from here? So Javier and Leo, please take the stage. Thank you, Igor. Thanks very much, Igor, for that lovely introduction. Um, and um, let me just get the slides, um, make them visible to you. I hope you see them now. And um, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to talk a bit about um, landscapes, maps, and, and territories of open education policy. Um, and um, so what, what, do we, what do we mean by this? Um, well, we've been doing quite a bit of work on mapping policies, um, and that's partly about figuring out what kind of policies um, are emerging around the world, um, at what kind of levels these policies exist, um, and, um, and working towards a kind of a landscape understanding 
um, of a big picture, and that's kind of very much on, ongoing. Um, and this got me thinking, um, uh, thinking about the phrase, the map is not the territory, which is a quote from the philosopher Alfred Korzybski, and it reminds us that it's really hard to know reality, that whenever we simplify and summarize the real and make a representation like a map, um, or try to produce an overview of it that we might refer to as a landscape, we remove so much and what we actually select is so little. And, um, and so it's actually sort of appealing for trust to say, I've, I've selected the most important things here. Um, but we really need to think about who does the map making, um, what makes it through their filter, and the fact that maps are often designed to privilege certain kinds of things um, like borders, like highways um, or superstores um, and, um, and these can fail to represent or even see um, the things that are most important to someone else who's kind of not in that position of being the map maker. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, policy with this in mind, because in some ways making policy is, um, is like a kind of roadmap um, that's supposed to show, show us how to get from, from A to B. And, um, sometimes the policy map we're making is of a little known or unseen territory. And as you can imagine, if you're trying to follow a map that doesn't adequately represent the territory that you're in um, and that you're trying to, um, you know, find your way through, um, this, could, this could be a, a real um, interruption or a delay to your journey or you might have to turn back. Um, and we think this this has some some relevance for the idea of um, of policy making, um, and um, you know how do we know um, that that policy is is going to be appropriate, is going to work, is going to be um, well received, um, um, and um, and as Catherine Cronin says, enabling. So in my work with um, Javier on this, and also in my um, my current um, PhD research project. Um, and also someone that works in a higher education institution, I've been really interested in particular in the local level policy making that we're doing in institutions um, or that we hopefully will do in institutions around open education and the relationship between policy and practice um, there um, on, on the ground of the territory um, and between that policy level and national and supranational levels. So I think in order to think about this better, we also need to engage um, in the first place with the thorny question of what do we actually mean by policy? And of course, there's many different ways of, um, of, of talking about and thinking about policy. And what, what we did um, in the, for the, um, the guidelines for co-creation that, um, that we produced that Igor mentioned um, in the introduction was we actually came up with a um, with our own definition of open education policies. Um, we wanted to work with quite a nuanced definition, not only focused on um, on resources but also on practices, and also not only considering um, policy as written policy texts, but also um, thinking about um, those unwritten policies that actually are uh, the way that we do things. The the um, the, the, no, the normal way that we do things or the way that we've agreed amongst ourselves um, that this is going to be handled. Um, and also things that may not seem to have a written policy attached, but where, for example, there might be funding directed towards an activity. So we have to think about that as also being a, a form of policy, even though those kind of undocumented um, kinds of policy are a bit harder to, um, to discover. So, Thinking about um, policy in open education, it's just advanced too far, um, as, a, as a kind of pyramid. I think that this, this represents, um, this is a, a graphic um, designed by Javier that, does, that, that um, represents how, um, in, in a sense, how policy is supposed to be working. When, when we think about it from the point of view of um, supranational organizations like UNESCO, they're providing recommendations and kind of a vision for open education. That's a foundation um, for national policies. Um, and, um, and then national policies should provide the, not just the kind of foundation, but also um, maybe funding and, and, and really uh, support to enable 
the activity that should be going on within um, within institutions, because that's kind of where the um, thinking, particularly about higher education here in the in the higher education institutions, that's where you've got the um, the, the academics, the students, the people who are going to actually um, do do the activity, and who are currently um, doing open education activity, often in the absence of um, of policy. Um, and the absence of policy, you might say, well, if they do it in the absence of policy anyway, then do we need policy? But I think what we see is that it's very much a sort of more of a niche activity most of the time. So policy really is needed in order to um, make, to enable um, so many more people to participate in this, in this kind of activity, I think. So, What we, would, what we would like to see to activate more activity at the institutional level would be a much stronger commitment, um, not least in terms of unlocking vital funding streams at national or at um, also state or similar levels. Um, but progress here seems to be really slow. So we've got kind of supranational um, level, really kind of strong message, um, especially from UNESCO. And we've got, um, you know, kind of leaders and advocates and, um, and um, really enthusiastic participants at the institutional level. And um, currently, I think, struggling to get the attention of those um, government, governments that, that hold the purse strings. So this is a, a, just a really high level kind of headline overview of what, what do we know from the, um, from the landscape. Um, and, and a key thing here is that open education policies are still fairly um, thin on the ground um, at the national level around the world and also at, um, at institutional um, levels. So we, we have some, um, some great examples um, which really show a path forward. And one of the great things about, about having a, um, a about um, organizations who produce open policies that they very often openly license their policies so that others can, um, can adapt them. Um, and I'm sure even if they haven't openly licensed them, um, they, they would be pleased to see some of the elements that they've um, put forward as, as key um, being, um, being echoed by others. And also open education policies where they exist um, currently tend to be um, quite OER focused. Um, and there's also a, a kind of a wider realm of open educational practices that, that relate to and support OER, but also um, other practices that, that are around um, opening up aspects of education, opening up access and participation. And um, is this an issue that these are less, less discussed or less well understood um, in the kind of policy discussion? I think maybe yes, um, because if we consider OER in isolation, um, then I think that it, it seems that the overarching goal of open education is to produce and use OER rather than to open up access and participation in education. Um, and it, I think an analogy is that if open education is kind of thought to be limited to OER, it's kind of like implying that education is really just the library. So um, at the policy making level, I think we need to think about a wider range of practices and the capacity building that we need to support people in taking up those practices. Otherwise, actually, um, none of it's going to work, not even OER, because, um, because we, we need people to um, have a lot of capacity for um, doing all kinds of um, actually um, digital as well as um, specifically open things in order to make this uh, kind of open education work. So I was hoping I could um, Cole and Javier to join me for the next part of the presentation to talk about some of the types of OER policies that, um, that we've encountered um, as we've been reviewing the landscape. Hi, hi everyone. Thank, thanks, Leo. Um, basically, this uh, typology, uh, it comes from a study that we did with Fabio Nashim Beni and, and other people, um, Paul Baxich, for the JRC a few, few years ago, and it's been a bit adapted of what is kind of the current uh, landscape uh, of, of 
open education or where you can find open education within like a policy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So first you have like the classic uh, dedicated open education and OE, OER policies. That's kind of the most classic policies you can find around. Then you have policies um, derived from uh, the national government action plans. So Yangon-do has some, some examples, I'm, I'm sure about it. Uh, so it's basically policies that may come from a national commitment that a country has been made within the national action plan in a time frame uh, with, with OGP. You can find some open education embedded in ICT or digital education policies. Um, I called it ICT, I think I need to kind of update that petal in the flower and call it ICT-digital education policies. In, in some of them, you can find a component of open and open education. Um, there, are, there is, and, and, and Gemma, who I saw listed in, 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 in the colleagues here, uh, she has found some examples of open education embedded within open access policies. And uh, also you have some policies uh, like general education policies, like big, um, huge chunk of national strategies or education strategies for uh, a ministry of education that have a component of open education within normally the ICT environment. Uh, and also, uh, oh, I noticed that I've made some, I messed around with the titles and, and the flowers, um, then I connect them well. I just noticed that I just changed the petals. And then uh, you have policies with strong focus on the labor market, yeah, that have a component on skills development through OER. So this is, this is basically the, the kind of landscape in, in, in the policy environment. Um, Leo? Sorry, I'm just advancing the slide. <laughs> um, so basically, when we've mapped around 300 policies um, or strategies, as we're asking, policies or strategies, it's actually, this is one of the tricks to find them around. Um, we found out that the most common and that comes from strategic priorities is OER, our OER policies and open textbook policies. And also, digital education policies to have a component of open education. So that comes from normally the strategic, institutional, or national level. Um, some um, policies that come from a strategic strand, yeah, but are less common, are policies that talk about practices instead of focusing on the resource, it could be textbook or OER. So this is kind of where it looks more. Then you have Least common ones are labor market ones and policies that talk about open education in within, for example, the open science context. And this is come normally from mandates uh, at university level. So you have to do open access and open science that comes normally from the mandate for getting publishing and publishing awards and stuff like that. So this is kind of least common, but there are some. OGP, very little and very little in the last round of OGP commitments. Um, and some common also that come from mandates are the open access policies that may have a component of open education, normally in the context of repositories of open access that now accept for years. So basically a bit of landscape, Leo. And, uh, and this is distribution at world level. So I just pass back to Leo. Um, and so in, um, in this one, we can also see some, uh, some indication of um, that the, the links of policy types with um, with their kind of geographical re region where they are more um, more prevalent. Um, so as we can see, the um, OER policy, open textbook policy, um, is um, is in the top right corner there. Um, most found in North America, um, to some degree Europe, and um, educational policy with an um, open education component, um, sometimes um, with more of an emphasis on practices. Um, we've, we've seen more evidence of this in Latin America, um, which is interesting. Um, and we will share the slides so that there, there are a few more that I will kind of do a quick overview. Um, at how are we doing for time, Igor, sorry. 
You have got three minutes left. Great. Okay. Uh, so, um, so it's important to think about some underpinning um, structures in um, open education policy. Um, copyright um, is um, is is key here. You don't want to end up creating policy that which is in in conflict with the way in which um, you. You, you need to handle copyright, other kinds of agreements that you have or um, kind of laws that need to be um, complied with. Um, open education policies um, need to work with your um, wider thinking around um, educational innovation. Um, overall policy coherence with other policies which touch on aspects of um, open practices like open science, open access, open data. Um, and your other policies, which are not open, like, again, like like copyright or the ways that you um, you kind of got um, governance around um, use of data and things like this, will need to um, you need to come into play when you're thinking about uh, policy development in this space. And um, and we we've highlighted here um, six key um, elements of policies. These are in the, um, the the document that we've mentioned earlier, the guidelines for co-creation. Um, but it's it's important to note that we we're not really saying what the what policy you need to ultimately create because that's not the that's not the purpose of co-creating policy. It's uh, it's really about what are the areas that um, might be really important to consider. Um, so this is what we consider the key elements areas that you want to make sure that your policy has some kind of um, uh, you know make some effort to address. Um, and again, coming back to the, the, the topic of um, kind of gov governance around, um, around technology and data, all of these issues are really um, becoming hot topics around what's happening with people's data, around their privacy, um, and the, the, uh, the idea of um, you know, if we if we move to much more open ways of doing things, is that are we are we automatically good in terms of um, of of the way that we are uh, caring for um, student data, for example, um, or um, you know, do we do we need to um, to you know consider those issues um, even in the context of doing uh, using open tools, open platforms um, for. Uh, what we consider valid open purposes. Uh, so finally, when we're thinking um, about co-creation, um, there are, there are some, some key elements working together that are vital to it. Um, it's about collaboration. It's about engagement with the community. Um, it's about bench learning, which is about making a link between, um, between benchmarking Finding out what's been what's been done elsewhere, what's worked for people elsewhere, um, and um, and you using that using that learning and then development of your own policy. Um, and so, in the terms of a co-creation co roadmap, um, don't forget to start with mapping policies that you want to review before starting to create create one of your own. Um, and when you get to the end of the process. Don't forget to share your policy back with the community so that others can benefit from your knowledge and your expertise. Um, this is a policy canvas that we've used in, in workshops um, for people to um, think through uh, their um, planning towards um, policy co-creation. Um, and we've provided say, some uh, relevant literature that might be of interest to um, future viewers of the slides. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to both of you, Javier and Leo. It's a um, really super helpful overview of the types of policy developments to date related to open education and also the typology of policies. Um, I have seen quite a few compliments in the chat window. Um, also, thank you. Well, thank you for the shout out also to Jan Gondol here. Well, Jan, uh, as far as the was quite instrumental in uh, embedding open education commitments within the national action plan um, in Slovakia under the Open Government Partnership Initiative. And um, also, thank you for 
highlighting the principles of the co-creation principles uh, on, on one of your, your previous slides. I think this is also something that was highlighted again uh, during the Monday webinar by the Dynamic OER coalition members. Um, I think it was also one of the UNESCO chairs who mentioned that actually co-creation as an approach to policy creation is really important. So it definitely um, is a really useful and important framework of action. And please share those links also in the chat window, if you can, uh, to these relevant publications and the slides as well. And if I may ask you to please also update your relevant spaces on the OEG Connect space too, that would be super helpful for everyone. There have been some questions in the chat and I think some, okay, let me just go through it. We have got a few minutes for, uh, for questions. There was one question I think from Chrissy who was asking whether you're using policy and strategy interchangeably or whether there is a difference. So please go ahead and try to address it in the meantime while I'm scanning for the rest. I, I did um, respond in the, in, the, in the chat quickly um, as uh, Javier was talking that, that yes, we, we do generally speaking um, see policy um, qu quite broadly, um, and that was kind of part, part of that, that discussion that, um, that I mentioned at the beginning around wanting to have quite a, quite a, nu a nuanced um, view of what policy is, and not necessarily as a, as a written document. Of course, the strategy can be a, a, a written strategy as well, but it can be at quite a high level, um, quite generic about kind of values and principles and um, the, the kind of things that we believe in. Um, and not necessarily um, at the more kind of roadmap to how to get there kind of level that you might get from policy, but not necessarily always. Um, but so we, we include all of those things. Yeah, and, and, and also because it's, it's the way that we basically mine, it, mine, mine them out. Um, you have, we, we've searched, we already collected around 320 uh, policies that um, it's basically a database for for Leo's PhD, and and one of the things that we we've, we've done is um, use terms such as strategy, action plan, policy, and then anything that it's kind of in the similar right in in, in other languages. So because in, in 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 North America they tend to talk more about strategy, and in the in the in the EU they tend to talk about more policy. And yeah, it's it's a bit of of a complicated landscape, but they're interchangeable. Yeah, I think we could spend another half an hour discussing conceptual matters. So thank you for that clarification, Leah. And uh, well, Gino, thank you for sharing that link to the OER wiki space, uh, the OER policy wiki space that we developed collaboratively with Leo. Uh, there was another question here, uh, someone asking whether you see any impact or effect of the UNESCO OER recommendation on policy developments at the national level, um, or whether that's still too early to see or to tell. Um, I think it's possibly a bit a bit too early to, to see. I know that, that UNESCO will be, um, the, the the great thing about the fact that it's a recommendation as opposed to um, the kind of prior um, instruments that they that they've produced, like the um, 2012 declaration, is that it, it means that they ask the member states to report back on what action they're taking in relation to the recommendation. So um, I, I think the next, the, the first round of reporting back is going to happen um, in 2022. Um, I, I may be, um, deluding myself but that I, I think so so um so that you know this is not some, this is not a process that happens constantly it's kind of a periodic um a call for um kind of updates from the member states about um about actions in relation to the uh, recommendation so I really hope that we will we will see some some more um evidence um by then um and um also I think uh as um Gemma was mentioning in the in the chat, another factor that I think is stimulating more interest and awareness has been uh, the impact of the pandemic and um, the realization that, um, th that that's happened kind of um, in many parts of the world that a lot of our uh, standard ways of doing things are not are, are not really uh, resilient in a in a scenario like that and um, and the it, so that that has provided um, a, a moment for people to think about. Um, what what open approaches could um, could provide um, and um, and one that I, I really hope is going to um, 
yield some some real uh, results there. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Leo and Javier. Thank you for addressing the additional questions in the chat window directly. That's really appreciated. So we have now uh, exhausted the Q&A question um, slot for everyone uh, for this particular presentation. So thank you very much, sorry. Thank you very much, Javier and Leo. I really appreciate your contributions and your work in this. Thank you, people. Igor. Thank you, Jan. Um, so we have got another, I think, 10 minutes left. Uh, this now can open up the discussion for everyone. Um, so if you have any questions for presenters, uh, for all of those presenters, you can you can ask them now, but otherwise I also have one general question that I would like to ask all of you. And just for your brief input. Okay, so while we are still waiting uh, for any additional questions, I'm just gonna pose a question. Um, as I was listening to these uh, presentations and just kind of reflecting on the content of, of the discussion, uh, one one of the central themes that resonated um, across the different presentations today, for me at least personally, is the role of network and communities. And networks, which can be both formal or informal, are really formed to achieve different goals or objectives. And as we heard today, they can be formed to, to foster collaborations, to share practices. Um, networks of communities can also help sustain open education initiatives in the long run. National or international policy networks uh, or communities are also important in the context of open education policy developments. Um, for example, many of the open education or OER developments in different countries have been driven by such networks. And such networks have also been playing an important role in international policy developments. So as was discussed or asked during, uh, during the session today, uh, here I'm referring to instruments such as the 2012 Paris OER Dec uh, Declaration on Open Educational Resources or the 2019 Recommendation on Open Educational Resources. But when networks do not function effectively, um, maybe they may not be inclusive, uh, or they dis disintegrate over time uh, because of lack of funding or because of other matters, um, rich club phenomenon might be one of them. Um, this can have, or this can impact uh, open education development and uh, or it can affect their gains that were made or in different countries, uh, but it can also have implications in the context of sustainability of such efforts. So my question to, to all of you here, is uh, really based on this observation, based on your experience and knowledge, uh, what recommendations do you have to actually ensure that networks or communities of open education practitioners, um, or policy advocates, librarians function effectively uh, over time? How can we ensure the sustainability of such communities as well? And I'm not referring here to only availability of funding, uh, to sustain operations of networks. Uh, well, in the absence of funding, what other strategies could be applied? So I know that this is a broader question, but I would appreciate some, some brief remarks from any of the speakers or even the participants in this session. And Sarah, you're muted. No, I know. I was just saying, right, with what Gino just put into the, the conversation, because I mean, ab absolutely. Um, and that's and that's a part of it is that um, when we're looking at policy development, who are the governing bodies that are coming up with these? Um, and you know that's that's a part of what you know I'm interested in discussing. I have no magic solution to that other than like making the conversation about the development of the governance as transparent as possible and continually inviting outside of the normal realm of discussion or groups for additional participation. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, the co-creation um, principles to policy creation that were discussed by Leo and Javier actually have some really concrete strategies on how to potentially handle this kind of rich club phenomenon in a way, in, in a way that you share information and solicit input or feedback into different stages of the policy preparation as well. Um, any other comments from, from the speakers or the attendees? I mean, I, I think it, it, is, it is really interesting, for example, that um, uh, th there seem, in, in my experience at least, there seems, for example, to be a clear absence of students in a lot of these policy-making um, 
arenas and in terms of soliciting feedback about these policies and the effect of the policies, even though ostensibly the students are at least in terms of not like sheer numbers, the most affected by anything to do with OER. Um, and uh, so these are the kinds of things that I, I think might be really interesting. And I think sort of, I was also sort of thinking about this idea of sort of mapping policy um, policies to sort of to incentives in terms of if we are talking about community building and thinking about how to incentivize different forms of contribution beyond the typical ones that we see in a lot of OER creation, um, which as you said, Igor, you know, tend to be around funding, but like what other um, types of incentives can we create that can really create this kind of wider participation and what role can policies play in that? Okay, thank you, Max. Any additional remarks either from Regretta or Paola? Paolo seems to be getting ready for also. Uh, I was gonna but, say uh, something. Um, I think just thinking about incentivizing or, or encouraging um, networks to keep functioning and not, not run out of steam. Um, uh, that so for not not so much in the um, in the even in the open context, but in terms of another network that I'm involved in, uh, kind of the co coordination of. I think one of in it's sort of a, a it's a kind of local um, ed tech um, people network. Um, we what we have um, what what we've tried to do is have quite a big group of people who are involved in the coordination, um, and in the in we've moved to an even larger group. Um, more recently than we used to have and it just makes it more resilient there are a few more people to kind of um, do some bits and pieces or say okay you know for this event I'm going to handle it um, when a lot of us especially over the last um, year and a half were kind of saying we know we should be doing something but we don't have any time and um, and so it's it's I think it really relates to this same topic that came up in the in the chat earlier in this session um, or I think um, maybe it was Chrissy who was talking about keeping people um, uh, or get, getting more people involved and kind of handing over the um, the 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 leadership um, and kind of sharing that around more. I think it's about saying it, you don't we don't only have a small group of leaders in this community. Thank you very much, Leo. Paola? Just, just one thought. Uh, connecting to what just Leo just said, uh, a concept that always comes back to my mind in this kind of uh, activities when they are collaborative, we want to have more people involved. We have to deal with struggles like in our case, for example, languages or uh, anyway, being as inclusive as possible means to enlarge the boundaries as far as possible, which creates complexity. And complexity often, in my mind, doesn't fit with perfection. Why should we care for perfection? That's my, my question. We should care for progressing and uh, being able to deal with uh, the non-perfection in everything we do is a way that uh, allows us to think that uh, what we do really matters and can be changed tomorrow by anyone else. So it's again giving away leadership, believing that the next person can uh, uh, add the right piece when the right moment comes. And it's not philosophical, it's really practical. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate your pragmatic approach here, uh, Paola. Thank you. Uh, Margreta? Yeah, what I'm thinking about is, is, is not practical at all, but I was inspired by... Uh, by the way Paola spoke about the librarian network earlier that um, so if you lack passion and if you lack uh, vision and if you lack values you won't get anything done so I think these kind of networks where people are not meeting up physically and talking to each other very often you need to spend a lot of time on values and talking about why are we doing this in the in the greater picture and and, uh, and what are our goals in for, in terms of values so, uh, why are we doing this uh, and what's our passions i think that will that is the the fuel that that runs such networks in the long run 
Great, thank you very much. Um, so we are pretty much out of time now, so I'm going to be getting ready to close the session. But before I do, I just so first of all, thank you to all of the presenters. You have been fantastic, and thank you for such an in, engaged audience of participants as well. Um, everybody has been really lovely. And I would also just like to thank Judith Sebesta. Uh, Judith, thank you for your comment uh, that you've put into the chat window as well. So as a reminder, Judith is our rapporteur for this session. So she's going to be compiling a report from this session. Thank you very much, Judith. And just to also encourage all of you that, you know, you have the link um, in the chat window for the session description, for this overall session description on OEG Connect. So you can also continue all of these conversations there uh, further. Or if you want to connect with presenters individually, you will be able to find the details on OEG Connect. So thank you very much to all of you again. It is, uh, has been an absolute pleasure to be part of this session and to help chair. Uh, this session as well and uh, so enjoy the rest of the conference uh, there is um, I would say a, a day and a half left depending on where you are connecting from and yes all the best and be safe and take care thanks Igor thank, thank you. you hi thank you thanks bye a lot bye. thank you bye 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 everyone bye bye yeah, we can stop the recording